Well, what's up, Mosaic? If we haven't met yet, my name is Ryan. I get to be the community director here at Mosaic. Uh, I need you to know a few things about me. First of all, I love math. I loved it in high school. I loved it growing up. I loved it when I went to college. I love using it in real life. Things like geometry and, uh, and, and different types of math help us better understand the size and shapes of things, especially when I'm trying to build something. I'll sit in meetings here at Mosaic uh, and have mental math battles with people on our staff that may or may not know that they're in mental math battles with me. But either way, I'm winning. All right. I also love math because it tells a story. It doesn't necessarily tell the whole story, but it can tell a story and you can quickly see whether you're winning or losing. For example, we had a recent debate uh, about Pop-Tarts and which Pop-Tart is best. There are people on our team, and we're going to pray for them, who had the audacity to assume that brown sugar cinnamon is the best Pop-Tart that exists. Oh, this is gross. Man, God be with these people. Um, when you look at the data, all right, and the math, the one that sells the most, obviously the one that's best, is frosted strawberry. Uh, math proved me right on that. Now, I do have to address just one crowd of people. There are people who texted me about s'mores Pop-Tarts. They, they are a sad little brother to this argument. Don't bring them in, all right? But know about me, I love math. Second thing to know, uh, about me is I'm regularly looking for a side hustle or some extra cash. And it's not because I'm necessarily bad with money. I just love spending money. I love blessing people around me. So I've had a variety of side jobs throughout my life. Everything from delivering papers, driving for Uber, to working a second job at Sheets at one point. Any way I can make some extra cash will be helpful for paying off some of our debt and blessing my family. If you fast forward to 2019, that's when I found this, Robin Hood. If you're not familiar, Robinhood was a trading app and still exists as a trading app where you can trade stocks uh, without any advisors or any fees or anything that was a problem. Their ads at that time asked if you followed patterns and trends and if you understand how the math works. And I'm like, I'm here. And then they're like, hey, you can make trades morning, noon, and night with no limits. And I was like, great, I'm awake at all those times. And then they sold it as something so simple. And they told me I don't need to become an investor because, quote, I was born an investor. <laughs> uh, when I watched those ads, when I checked out their website, they sold their app as my path to financial freedom and I bought it hook, line, and sinker. The, this thing, in my opinion, in that moment was made for me. I skimmed a few articles. I was on my way to becoming a lifelong day trader. Soon enough, I was buying low, selling high, diversifying assets and investing in sectors I'd never even heard of. In my mind, I was about to be king of the world. And then all of a sudden, my account got frozen because apparently you're not allowed to make that many trades in a day. I didn't know that day trading is something you have to officially register for. And I've learned since then that investing is probably something you should study, not just start doing. But over the next few weeks, I watched my stocks start to decline, my gains turned into losses, and the free stock I'd been so excited to get was now worth a whopping 11 cents. Roughly a month after I started, I cashed out with less than I invested. And before I knew it, the thing that I thought was made for me suddenly became too good to be true. And now, my experience as a day trader may not be the thing that you've experienced, but I'm sure you've experienced times in life where you signed up for something that you thought was going to be made for you, and it turned out to be too good to be true. One area that shows up for a lot of us is when it comes to politics and politicians. We walk in looking for something good, like people and policies that are going to lead us to freedom. We'll hear promises full of virtue and things that are supposed to lead to life in our world. We feel compelled to align ourselves with the ones we love uh, in a hope of a better world, but then what we experience is unfulfilled and unmet expectations that leave us in the same place or somewhere worse than we started. And it's more than just frustrating. We become disheartened, disgusted, and disengaged, ready to throw in all the towel altogether. And it's because what was meant to be for us turns out to be too good to be true. And when we start to lack trust for authority, it isn't a far jump to get angry at God. We start to look at him and figure out why he didn't do the things the way we thought he should, or we explore what he could have done or should have done differently next time. We can quickly find ourselves in that place where what was made for us, the party we were supposed to belong to, becomes something too good to be true. And if you've ever felt like that, if you've ever looked at the current political landscape in our world and wondered, how do we actually get out of this mess? I've got some good news for you. You're not alone. 
the Jewish people, thousands of years before Jesus, were in a similar position where they looked at the world around them, they were frustrated, they were let down by what they experienced, they longed for something more like many of us do, and they had ideas on how to actually get there. They were convinced that they had a fix, but then, in the end, it turned out to be something that was just too good to be true. And before we zoom in on their proposed solution and specific situation, we're going to zoom out to get a better understanding of all the things that actually factored into this. Hang on with me. This is a bit of a history lesson. Thousands of years before Jesus, there was a man named Jacob. Jacob regularly spent time with God. And at one point, God tells Jacob, I'm going to build a nation out of your lineage. And over the next several generations, the Jewish population just begins to flourish underneath Jacob. A few generations after Jacob, it becomes more of a three-party system. The first group of people leading in, in, uh, in the nation were the prophets. Prophets are people who are connected to God, who direct and warn the people on God's behalf. Second group of leaders that's in there are the judges. These people could also be prophets, but their job as judges was to help judge the nation, fight against injustice, uh, help bring wisdom to disputes. And then lastly, there's a third group of leaders in Israel known as the elders. They were Uh, leaders of different family lines. They represented like the lineage and the specific families and tribes in a much larger group of people. Fast forward a few more generations and we're introduced to a guy named Samuel. Samuel as an infant is dedicated in the temple by his parents to be a servant of the Lord. He literally spends his entire life uh, in the temple serving God and eventually becomes a prophet of God and a judge of Israel sitting in a dual role. The Jewish people flourish under the leadership of Samuel and the people begin to trust him. As he gets older and kind of preparing to leave a legacy, he begins to delegate authority to his two oldest sons, Joel and Abijah. Now, the problem with his sons is they weren't like Samuel. They weren't men of integrity who followed God. Scripture specifically says about them, they were greedy for money, accepted bribes, and perverted justice. And the people noticed So eventually the elders of Israel get together in their little huddle. They have a conversation and they go to Samuel with this complaint. Samuel, your kids aren't like you. And we don't trust them. We want a king like all the other nations have. As you could expect, Samuel gets offended by that. He goes back and complains to God. And he says, God, the people don't like me. And God goes, no, Samuel, the people don't like me. They're rejecting me as their king, not you as their prophet. And God says, listen, if they want a king, you can give them a king, but you need to give them a warning. Go back and warn them sternly that a king is going to take a lot from them and may not be what they actually want in the end. So Samuel goes back to the elders, and he brings them a warning about how the king is going to take their property and their time and their taxes. He recognizes that the king is going to offer some protection. Yes, he'll bring you some value, but he's going to do it by recruiting your children and your servants, by taking your land and the best of what it produces. As soon as you have a king... The best of what you have will all of a sudden be his. You don't want that. And then he pauses and reminds them, listen, God is still your king. He is still with you. He's the one who's rescued you and cared for you and loved you. Keep trusting in him. But look at how the people respond. The people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. They said, even so, we still want a king. We want to be like the other nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel, hearing that, goes back to God. He goes, God, they still want a king. And God goes, fine, then give them one. And so over the next few chapters of the book of 1 Samuel, we see Samuel find a man named Saul who's big and strong and can represent the nation well. Samuel anoints him to be the first king of Israel. And when Saul steps in as king, he quickly leads them into war and defends his people fighting off oppression. The people are excited to be free from oppression and they look forward to their future with Saul as their leader, but things quickly begin to change. They were in a spot where they were like, this is what we were made for. And then it shifts. Saul stops fighting off oppression and starts to become the oppressor. He's an emotionally manipulative leader and For the next 42 years, the people win many wars publicly in front of the nations, but personally and privately, they struggle under the leadership of Saul. Their kids go to battle, their servants go to the king, their money funds the war, and their nation is centered around serving the selfish whims of a self-serving king. They're now under the leadership of somebody who's no longer following God, and they feel as if God is no longer with them. And in the end, we find the people repenting of making an idol out of having a king, and 
They repent of rejecting God and placing their hopes in a political leader. And we see God forgive them. He reconnects them. He reconnects with them and establishes a new kingdom through a guy named David. And God tells the people, listen, this is a man after my own heart. He can be trusted. But their struggle began because they were frustrated. They were frustrated with with what they experienced, like many of us are. They chose to make some compromises in an attempt to get something different. And those compromises that they made led to decades of suffering that could have been avoided if they just would have placed their hope in the right thing and trusted God from the beginning. Now, history lesson over. I know that story is thousands of years old, but it's not much different from what you and I experience today as followers of Christ. If we're not careful, if we're not intentional, we can take our eyes off of God, place our hope in something so much less, and then find ourselves struggling to get back to good. So over the next few minutes this morning, my goal is to unpack the three compromises that the people of Israel made as they pursued a king and better understand how we, in 2024, can avoid the pitfalls that they experienced. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first compromise they made was thinking that fitting in was greater than having integrity. They were concerned more with fitting in with the crowd than they were with having integrity. In the verses we already read, we saw that the people refused to heed the warning of the Lord and said, we want a king anyway. But take a look at why they did it. Look! Samuel, you're now old. Your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. And then in verse 20, we want to be like the other nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us in the battle. That's what they do. See, they compromised uh, because they wanted what all the other nations had. They looked around at everybody else and they go, I want what they experience. And instead of having God as their king, they find a person to be the face of their people. They were concerned because they didn't have a mouthpiece for their interests, and other nations looked at them and didn't know who led them. And they were frustrated by it. But this idea of fitting in over having integrity is something we battle today. And this idea of like having a representative is something that frustrates us, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on. I hear people get frustrated with whoever the president is because they don't feel like they represent them well as people. At the end of the day, we all want people who represent us well, and so do the people of Israel. It's not just true on like a global scale, it's true on a personal level too. Just like the people of Israel made compromises so they could be more like the people around them, you and I find ourselves guilty at times of compromising to fit in with the people around us. When it comes to politics, think about it at work. We want to fit in during the conversation at lunch so we bite our tongue instead of speaking the truth that we actually believe. In our friend groups, we repeat what the loudest person says over what we actually believe. Online, though, it's a little bit different. We'll watch videos and listen to podcasts of people that think like us and we'll store up their quotes like ammo against our opposition, but then we only hang out with people that agree with us and we isolate ourselves from those who don't. Things went wrong for the people of Israel when they stopped pursuing long-term integrity and started pursuing short-term connections. They became focused on their image and how they were seen over staying true to what they believed, and we can be guilty of the same thing. We long for connection, and we make compromises to get it. We live in a world experiencing an epidemic of loneliness, and most of us find ourselves looking for a tribe. And it's a good thing to have a tribe of people that you agree with and see worlds similar to, but finding our tribe can't become greater than the gospel of Christ. So as followers of Jesus, we have to be people who pursue integrity over pleasing our crowd. The people of Israel compromised because they were frustrated with with the world that they lived in and they were hungry for something better. They didn't think that they had an option besides trying to fit in. And many of us don't think we have a better option either. The second compromise that we have to avoid is making a good thing greater than the main thing. It's a simple phrase. You've got to keep the main thing the main thing. The same is true in our faith. For the Jewish people... Having a king offered them four really good things. It offered them security, identity, progress, and responsibility. A king offered security because he could defend them. Identity because he would become the face of the nation. He offered them progress because he could take them to new places. And he offered them responsibility by giving them purpose and something to do in a means of accomplishing it. 
And we see it throughout the chapters of 1 Samuel that I summarized earlier, but I want to highlight a few verses where these things really come to light. In in chapter 8, verse 20, it says this, We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will lead us, or our king will judge us and lead us into battle. You know what it is to lead somebody into battle? It provides security. They thought he was the one that was going to keep them safe. They disregarded the fact that God had been with them, defended them, led their army, blessed their army, rescued them from slavery, and prevented things from happening to them. They put all that on the back burner and they knew God, but they chose to have a king so they could be seen by the people around them and they could actually feel safe. Second thing he offered was identity because he became the face of the people. In chapter 10, it says this, they found him, meaning Saul, and they brought him out and he stood head and shoulders above anyone else. What a good image for a king. And then Samuel said to all the people, this is the man that the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in all of Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, Long live the king! They loved that their new king was head and shoulders above the rest. The fact that he was broad shoulders and looked like he worked out often, obviously like I do. That was not a joke. And laughter hurts, all right? It's obviously a joke. Ah, the fact that he's broad shouldered and bigger than the people around him, appealed to them. They longed for a representative that could represent them to their people, and he did that. They wanted somebody who represented them well, and he was it. And they were convinced, they bought in to this lie, that if they had an identity, then they could have what they always wanted. They could finally be known. And granted, it would be like the king's face in front of the people, but it represented them, and they loved it, and they were proud of it. It's why they respond, long live the king. All right, so a king provides security because he takes them to war and protects them from oppression. He provides identity because he becomes the face of the people. But he, offers also, he also offers them progress. Look at 1 Samuel 14. When Saul had secured his grasp on Israel's throne, he fought against his enemies in every direction. That means a lot of war, but also a lot of progress if he's successful. He fought against Moab, Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. And wherever he turned, he was victorious. Throughout his 42-year reign, Saul went to battle multiple times and every time comes back victorious. He expands their borders and stockpiles resources. In their mind, he was moving their people forward. There were advances they experienced under the leadership of Saul that they don't think would have happened without him. And the people are convinced that he would lead them to new ground, offering them progress in ways that they couldn't even imagine. With Saul as their king, they were finally able to be better than before. And then the last good thing he offered them was a sense of responsibility. With it, they had a purpose and a job to do. At the end of chapter 14, here's what it says. The Israelites fought constantly with the Philistines throughout Saul's lifetime. That makes sense. He led a ton of wars. But here's where they get involved. Where, and whenever Saul observed a young man who was brave and strong, he drafted him into his army. You go, I don't want to be drafted, but think about this. If your nation was focused on war, like Saul was, Saul was so focused on war that he could... He would find anyone who could fight and he would draft them into the army. And for the person who's drawn in by a desire for responsibility, he gave them a job, a place to belong, and something to be a part of. He gives them something to do and somebody to serve. They finally had purpose. And the elders of Israel become so sold on this idea of a king being the solution to their problems and the virtues that he could bring being the thing that was going to fix the world around them that they bought in, just like I did to, to Robin Hood, they bought in hook, line, and sinker. They made idols out of the idea of having a king and the good things that he could bring them. In many ways, they experienced some temporary success and some short-term fulfillment, but in the end, they're left with the heartache of misplaced hope. The ideas of things like security and identity, progress and responsibility are great gifts that ultimately come from the God of the universe. But when we place them on the throne as a God themselves, they make awful rulers. If you fast forward to 2024 and our current political landscape, those four virtues are the same good things that I think we're sold today as the solution to all of our problems. The king offered them four things, security, identity, progress, and responsibility. Our current political landscape, a certain group is offering us security. 
We have groups trying to sell us on the idea of security, talking about how it provides healthy boundaries to keep people safe and ultimately how that's a good thing. This isn't a new concept. Adam and Eve lived in safety and had a garden to protect. Throughout the Bible, God gives rules and boundaries for our good. They allow us to work and raise families and build communities. God is a defender who is out to establish the security of his people and protect his kingdom from evil. Security is a really good thing. But when it becomes the ultimate thing, we begin to take the shield that was given to us as a means of protecting ourselves and our families, and we start to use it as a weapon to preemptively attack the people around us. If we overbuy into the, idea, the ideology of security, it can be used to justify racism and nationalism and isolate us from people that God never intended for us to be isolated from. And then there's identity. Identity allows us to be known. And according to Scripture, the Lord gives us an identity. He instructs us to inspect ourselves so that we can better understand ourselves. He says, continue to discover who you are meant to be. And this idea of pursuing identity allows us to know ourselves, be able to grow as people and be able to express ourselves in a way that's unique to us. But when identity becomes the main thing in our lives, it becomes destructive. We start to rank ourselves by status and titles alone. Our identity is no longer a child of God. We now take on new titles like breadwinner, boss, and influencer. Who we are is now defined by how we see ourselves and whatever we think is going to make us happy. And when our identity is based simply on how we see ourselves, it fails to be enough because we know we're flawed deep down on the inside. Then the third thing, there's progress. And with progress comes technological advances and modern medicine and air conditioning and awesome things that we love and get to experience. Because of progress... Here in America, many of us live longer lives than any generation before us, and many of us have less pain than any generation before us. That's great. But progress, when it's made an idol, quickly turns its back on us. It becomes this inward-eating game where things like food development, meant to feed more people who are impoverished, quickly becomes the thing that makes us more addicted to sugar. The iPhone or Android that was supposed to make us aware of things now leads to more anxiety than anything else. Progress has made us more aware of global brokenness than ever before, and in doing so, it's made us more aware of our own inability to fix it. And then there's responsibility. This is the fourth one. This one's my favorite. It's the one I easily fall into if I'm not careful. It's a good thing that I value, but I can't make it a God. At its best, responsibility leads to fulfillment and a family to serve. It provides a job to do, a difference to make, and a task to accomplish. But at its worst... It becomes graceless and judgmental of the world around us because those people should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps just like we supposedly did. Now, if I get together with my buddies who are simply focused on responsibility like I am at times and we start riffing, we'll quote guys like Jocko Wilnick and Mike Rowe and Jordan Peterson. We'll talk about things that we value like extreme ownership and doing dirty jobs and making your bed as a means of controlling the things you can control and not worrying about the world outside of that. It'll be awesome. It'll also push out all the people who actually need help, and it'll justify us having a sinful apathy towards pain in the world and anybody who's struggling. We'll point the finger at people uh, who, who are hurting and just say they should have done better or they should have had better parents. And see, it's in those moments when I find myself judging those people and making responsibility the idol of my life that my judgment starts to turn on me and I find myself in the crosshairs of my own gracelessness. Things like my ability to check my inbox or stay off of YouTube or spend a little bit more time with my kids become the ways that I harshly judge myself and begin to hate who I am. I find myself with nowhere to go. And it's in those moments where I've made responsibility too valuable that I have to do what all of us have to do when we're out of line with God. I've got to repent. I've got to call out my selfishness and my misguided hope, repent of my sin, and then return to God, allowing him to be the one who provides my restoration. Now, that's my story. But my question for you this morning is, what are you longing for? Maybe it's with this election. Maybe it's just in our world. Maybe it's in your family. What are you longing for? Out of those four good things I mentioned of security and identity and progress and responsibility, which one appeals to your soul the most? 
Does the idea of security and a safe place to land appeal to you? Is it high fences make the best neighbors because that blocks out the chaos of the world around me? Maybe you're searching for an identity in a world consumed with identity. Like it's the promotion, the relationship status, or the amount of followers you have that you're looking to to be the thing that validates your worth to you. Maybe it's progress that your heart longs for because you're worried you've become stagnant or stuck in this life. Are you searching for a solution that could fix the problem and just move life forward again? Maybe you're like me. It's responsibility that appeals to you. You're convinced if we could just get more people to do the right things for the right amount of time, we'll go to the right places. Whatever it is that sticks out to you, whichever one of it is that appeals to you the most, are you making a God out of something meant to be good? Is your hope in the virtue, like if we can just get more of that thing, we'll all be good? Or is your hope in the gospel of Christ? Because if your hope is misplaced, let this morning be the time where you recenter and repent and focus on the main thing of the gospel. That leads into the third compromise that people of Israel made. And that was trusting what they could see over trusting what they couldn't see. In every scripture we've read this morning, the people chose what they could see over what they couldn't. It led them to be like the other nations around them. The problem is, is that God wasn't with the other nations. And so in their pursuit of something good, they left God along the way. They chased good things and made them their God instead of submitting their lives to God and allowing Him to be their King. Thousands of years later, when Jesus is in front of a politician being questioned about His own kingdom, This is what he says. He says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. My kingdom is not of this world. That means, for those of us in the room who are following Jesus, if his kingdom is not in this world, then we have to hold Christ as the one true king regardless of who our president is. And this fall, we'll do our best to honor the president. And we'll do our best to follow what we're asked to do as long as it's not out of line with scripture. But our hope is not in a candidate. It's not in a philosophy. It's not even in a good virtue that ultimately comes from God. Our hope is in the God of the universe. The world of politics will do its best to sell you a solution that involves something virtuous but comes with a vice. And when you buy in, you'll find yourself selling out to something you never really wanted. So instead of selling you something, Jesus comes in and he offers you something. He's offering you truth and he's offering you grace. He offers you an identity that can satisfy your soul. And instead of buying it and spending everything you have, you get to receive it and gain something for the rest of eternity. You get forgiveness and grace, relationship and purpose. You get a new way of living. And then, as we step into a new way of living where we do things with Christ instead of absent from Christ, we get to experience what we've longed for from a whole different angle. For those longing for security, people desperate to find a safe space, it starts with a heavenly Father who sees you and protects you and promises that nothing can snatch your soul out of his hand. He says, listen, if you die, and you will die because everybody dies here on earth, nothing can take you from me. You are safe within my presence, so come and be with me. That's the offer from God. For those longing for identity, instead of it being something we long for, it becomes something we receive. When we follow Jesus, we become a child of God and we're somebody worth sacrificing for. We no longer have to wonder if we're valuable or if we mean anything. We no longer have to discover who we are so we can finally be noticed because of the God of the universe looks down and he sees us and he weeps over us and he dies for us so that we could be free. Your identity and my identity comes ultimately from him. If you're seeking progress and a little bit more wisdom, when you do it with Christ, you get to connect with a God who is the author of truth and wisdom. 
And when we center ourselves with his word and his wisdom, we can move life forward in ways we never thought possible. Through Christ, we find the wisdom that we've been longing for and the progress we so desperately desire. And as a result of all of that, we don't have to seek progress so we can make a difference and feel like we matter. Instead, we get to seek progress as a way of blessing the world around us because God has blessed us. And then lastly, if you're a person looking for more responsibility, things like responsibility to yourself, your family, and your community, they are great things and they are part of God's design so that people can live life in a community that holds one another up through sacrifice and grace. And when we learn to lean in to responsibility with God instead of away from God, we find belonging that we've always longed for and the purpose that we so desperately need. It's no longer about doing tasks so we can check the box so we know we matter. It's serving the world around us with God because he matters and brings his good news to the world through us. So when we learn as followers of Jesus to seek the things we so desperately long for through Christ instead of absent from Christ, it not only changes the world around us, it begins to change us on the inside. The world's no longer on our shoulders. It's now on God's, and he's more than capable of handling it. We simply get to be part of his plan to help redeem the world. So if you want something greater than politics is trying to sell you, if you want something more meaningful than the, what the world has to offer, Jesus has an invitation. He says, come to me. Submit your life to me and join me in my mission to redeem the world around you. And if you've never chosen to submit your life to Christ, that starts by checking the baptism box on your connection card and learning about what a relationship with Jesus actually looks like. If you've already done that, if you've already submitted your life to Christ, let this morning be a time to reconsider. Have I placed my hope in something less than Jesus? And if so, repent. And start to shift it back to where it needs to be. But Mosaic... Regardless of who wins the election this fall, our hope is still in Christ. So as we close, let me just remind you of a couple of things we talked about this morning that will help us keep a proper perspective as we head into the fall. First of all, pursue integrity over pleasing the crowd. Secondly, keep the main thing of the gospel the main thing in your life. Where is the gospel redeeming you? Should be a regular question in your quiet time. And three, focus on God's kingdom that you can't see, not the political kingdom you can see. Our hope is in Christ, not something else. If we'll do that, God promises that there's something so much greater for us on the other side of all of this. Let's pray. God, I'm frustrated with our political landscape. I'm frustrated with things in our world. I look and I see brokenness and I see uh, a lack of progress and a lack of responsibility and a lack of identity and a lack of security. There's things that scare me and worry me, things that make me want to shut my doors and block out the world around me. But God, you call us to engage. You call us to be involved. You call us to be light in the midst of darkness. And God, we want to do that. So this fall, we're not running from politics but we're also not putting our faith in politics. God, would you help us this morning to just recenter our faith on you so we could experience the hope of rightly placed hope and rightly placed faith, not the pain of misplaced hope. God, you're good. We love you. We're thankful to get to do your mission with you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen.